good to see you again this morning. Listen to this prayer. Father, your wounded heart. I know your wounded heart, Father. I've heard your sobs, and I have felt the depths of your desolation. You see, the God of human beings does not hear, does not see. He doesn't want to know anything about your pain. That God with a metallic and cold heart, loved by the powerful of the earth, is deaf to your will. He does not want to know anything about your kingdom. To you, on the other hand, the undesirable condition of the poor crowds hurt. They do not have money, but feel eaten up in their bellies by the perennial pain of everyday hunger. It hurts you, Father, the extreme poverty of widows and orphans, made widows and orphans by the generals of Guatemala, Chile, Paraguay, Haiti, or Namibia. Your heart hurts, God, Father, because the wealthy Protestants worship a metallic and fundamentalist God in very expensive temples where blacks, brown, indigenous, and others are not truly accepted. I feel inside my chest the infinite pain of your oppressed heart, Godfather, because many Christians in the domes of churches fear more the idol that keeps them satisfied in their prestigious positions than hurting your heart, that of a merciful and compassionate Father. Wow. I yeah, it kind of leaves you speechless, right? I don't think it is difficult for us to resonate with words like these. All you have to do is to is just live a little. And you will feel the burden of this prayer and, and poem. Why? Because the, this longing for, for justice and hope, it is, a, it, it is a human reality. Whether you are a believer or not, you do know that things are not the way they're supposed to be. And for Christians, it is of utmost importance that, that this theme, that we, we not only see it in the Bible, but it is even at the core of the very act of praying. Let your kingdom come. Jesus taught us to pray. So even a prayer like the one we just heard, is a powerful reminder that we can live a life that participates in what God is doing in the world to, to rectify it, to, to rescue it, to renew it. And as the people of God, we, we need each other. We, we, people from every ethnic and cultural background, we need each other in order to explore the beauty and the possibilities of expressing what it means to love Jesus, and to live a life of justice before God. And that is what we've, we've been discussing during this week, the missional nature of the Christian faith and the contributions that one region of the world of Christians have done to the, to the universal church, the Latin American church and Latin American theology, I think has some counsel to, for us to how to how to participate with God. And in terms of being witnesses, we know that there are aspects that we celebrate, there are aspects that we lament, and there are many things to hope for. We, we trust that God is in the move to restore everything in life, and not only your personal lives and, and your struggles and your sins, your shortcomings, but ultimately a vision of everything restored. For Jesus lived the life that we should have lived, but we didn't. And he died the death that we faced, but we did not confront. So that we, with the rest of creation, might live a life that is, that is full of flourishing and true freedom. Now, I, I would like to consider briefly, based on Luke 4, this calling to, to, to live life as an embodied witness 
to another kind of justice, the faithful justice that the gospel presents to us. So Luke Ford offers us a, a, a beautiful picture of how Latin American missions, for example, think about the liberating work of the Messiah. And not only Latin American missions, but also African missions and Asian missions. Luke tells us that after the temptations in the desert, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And in, he goes to the synagogue and then he declares the preeminent nature of his ministry as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. The Messiah will redeem those who have been abandoned, exploited, and enslaved, the impoverished, the blind, the captives, the oppressed. This Messiah is full of the Spirit. It is the one who bears absolutely the Spirit in power, and he affirms the good news of salvation. This is God's salvific plan for all of us. So that liberation is what Jesus defined as the center of his reign. Jesus' mission is, display, is displayed in the way that he healed people, in his exorcisms, in his confrontations with religious and political authorities. It is cutely portrayed in, in his giving of food to the multitudes, in the formation of, of a new community of sacrificial service to, to the neighbors. It is not theologically insignificant that Jesus feeds 5,000 because he cares also about their stomachs. He did not over-spiritualize it and say, accept me in your heart and you will never be hungry again. You don't have to eat this afternoon. No, no, no. He cared deeply about everything in their lives while at the same time communicating to them that he is the true bread of life. So these are the signs of the kingdom. These are the historical conditions that confirm that Jesus is who he claims to be, provide the content of his liberating work, his agenda, and establishes the kind of people that he's forming. We will also say with Luke and, and Matthew in the Gospels that the good news is the, is the good news for the poor and the poor of spirit. This is a the disposition of the soul and heart to receive the gospel. The person that does not have this disposition it will actually find it very difficult and hard, even incomprehensible. Why is it that God cares so much about the materially poor or the real poor? Why? Well, because that person who is not poor in spirit will still believe that everything depends on the logic of meritocracy. That because you did things good, then you are rewarded with good things. And therefore, somehow you are superior. In contrast, the gospel logic is one of giving of the self, commitment to love and neighbor, not in the service of those who are like me or are like-minded or from my culture alone or from, from the people that my tribe deems worthy, but expressing in love and service, in service to anybody that needs it. These, are, these words cannot be over-spiritualized in a world like ours, says Samuel Escobar, where there are millions of people who are poor, broken-hearted, captive, blind, and literally bruised. It calls in us an attitude in which we make space in our lives to enter into the lives of the most vulnerable. The good news of Jesus liberates us from many bondages, many oppressions. Internal, we all have internal oppressions, our own shortcomings, our own vengeances, our sin, our blindness. Our, we are selfish to the core. Martin Luther called that we are incorvatus in se, in Latin. We are just like, like a ball to, our, to ourselves. But Jesus also wants to liberate us from external enslavements. That is, those things that dehumanize us. The consolidation of human sin in the structures that we create, in the cultures that we create. We see these structures in 
social injustices, in miseries, in, in the idolatries that we have towards money and, and sex and ethnocentrism and racism. The Spirit of Jesus, in contrast, creates in us, through the power of the Spirit, a capacity to confront our oppressions and the oppressions of others. We are called to, to live this transformed life so that even the way that we make sociopolitical decisions are a testimony. It's a testimony to how God is calling us to live. We extend God's grace and help and time to the most vulnerable. The elderly, for example. Women, children, the impoverished, the victims. These are the honored guests of the kingdom of Jesus. Missiologist Orlando Costas reminded us that when we are saved by faith in Christ, we commit to those for whom he suffered. Salvation lies outside the gates of cultural, ideological, political, and socioeconomic walls that surround our religious communities and shape the structures of Christendom. That is, we are not saved as a ticket to a privileged spot in God's universe we are saved for the freedom to serve in God's universe. Christians, followers of Jesus, we are people who were called to respond to this grand story in which we are inserting ourselves of rescue, of everything. And that, that is why we ask in the previous message, is there life before death? Because many, many people are just interested in life after death. But no, no, no. But is there life before death? Well, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, says the Bible. Not counting people's sins against them. So we see this reality of God, God in solidarity with the victims of sin, with the victimizers also. So that he is the one who liberates all of us. So that we can also emulate his life and justice and love and mercy towards others. And this liberation is remarkably portrayed in scripture. But especially when you look at Jesus' actions. The crucified Messiah who was resurrected on our behalf. God's liberating actions are experienced now and in the future. Both for those who are in union with Christ. But we learn also a second thing is that salvation entails the shaping of an embodied existence for a new creation. It is not only that, that feeling that you feel in your heart. Because deep inside our heart, we're good people. So deep that it's sometimes very difficult to see it. Right? Believe me. Believe me. I have it in him in my heart. Really? Okay. Can I just see him a little bit? Can we see Jesus in our hearts? The gospel, we can say, that Jesus is the good news of the triumph of God over human and non-human enemies. The enemies are reconciled to God because they are called to repentance. That is us. The appropriate response to this gospel is the embrace and celebration and the declaration of my absolute allegiance to the one who is light, life, and love. And this reach of the gospel is not only about saving my soul, it is by saving everything that exists. And if you are part of the ecclesia, of, of the people of God, or if you're a follower of Jesus, with other countless of people throughout history who follow Jesus Christ, you are commissioned. You are commissioned to embody this renovation of life. You are called to rehearse in your own life with others, together with others, that another world is possible. That another society is possible. Life before death is a reality. Now, many do not face this reality. Many are not living this reality. In disasters, 
The Christian church has historically assumed a role of social agents, a rescue and relief, and community development. Exactly a year ago, on Wednesday, September 20th, 2017, a Category 5 hurricane, Maria, hit Puerto Rico dead center. The East Coast right now also is suffering from a hurricane disaster. Now, it is still extremely difficult to describe the magnitude of the, ma of, the, of the damage. An island that is known for being unbreakably green and, and lush was turned completely brown, dry, burned. Our family, with the rest of more than 3 million people, we hunkered down. We had no idea what was happening. Sustained gust winds of 180 miles per hour were tearing apart the country. We pulled out our candles. We wonder how bad is the damage, but most of us could not even leave our neighborhoods because everything was barricaded with broken trees, floods, water. Employees will not get to their jobs even one week after the event. Employers could not get electricity to open their businesses. You have to make six, seven, eight hours of line to get a, two liters of gas. Hospitals were not working. And as soon as we could finally start navigating the city, we could see the devastation. Patients could not get medical help. People were dying, thousands of them. The most vulnerable were living the worst nightmare. The horror stories began to pour in. So as a church, me, our team, and many other churches in Puerto Rico, within a few days, we began a network of handful of churches mutually supporting each other with, 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 with resources to reach the isolated communities where help was not, go, where, where, was not arriving. We acquired supply. We had planes, personal planes, from people flying from Florida uh, to bring us supplies so that we could help people, deliver them in predetermined points of distribution to be organized in survival kits. We loaded up our vehicles, performed mission after mission, over 300 of them. We supply food, medicine, water, baby food, water purification systems. Our strategy was to find local churches, local churches with leaders, most of them from the ages of 18 to 27. Give them resources that they needed so that they could reach isolated communities that we could not reach. We confronted the local government and the federal authorities many times. We got lies. At times we were ignored. We were sending GPS pins to Coast Guard helicopters so that they could reach people with water and food. Were we heroes? No, we were just the church. This is what we're called to do. We are uniquely qualified to this mission of serving people in dire straits. So when we think about our situation and we think theologically about disaster zones, for example, or any situation of human turmoil, we also get to know that there are many structural stuff that are happening, political problems that facilitate and perpetuate and diffuse our attempts to construct a more just society, even in natural disasters. After the hurricane, to the devastation, to the hunger, to the houses in ruins, to Roxanne walking with her three baby girls 10 miles to find some water, to the barrios across the rivers where it was dangerous to go, it was the evangelicals, the Pentecostals, mobilizing en masse, endangering their lives, filling vans with food, driving to the mountains, and saying, here is God for you. This, without trying to figure out what was the most correct strategy, without having the most sophisticated critique of governmental structures, or the failure of FEMA, or the local administration, that didn't matter. Christians, they see, they judge, and they act. This is a basic intuition in Latin America from churches. See, judge, act. 
Can you see when you look around here in this context? Can you judge? Can, can you act? You see, being faithful to the justice that God brings, to the ultimate purposes of God, is about participating in a dream of another possible world, and it requires that we see, judge, and act. In the last decade, we have seen some of the largest demographic moves around the world. Millions of people in the largest refugee crisis since the Second World War. Can you see? For years, there has been a human crisis at our border with morally reprehensible conditions where the most vulnerable are women, the elderly, and children. Can you judge? The fear, frustration, and anger that many African Americans and brown people, our brothers and sisters have because their bodies are frequently subject to abuse or even killed by somebody in authority, it's unacceptable. Can you act? See, judge, act. Jesus Christ live, calls us to live His justice. Not our justice, His justice. To put our loyalty to Him above everything else. Knowing that we are weak, that we don't have all the answers, but knowing that we do not need all the answers. All we need is to be faithful to the Lord Jesus. Know that we are commissioned to embody this renovation of human life, that God is establishing another world amongst us. Is there life after death? Yes, but even more so, there is life before death. Life in this life. And if we have to lay down our lives so that others might live, which is the greatest act of love that we can make, then so help us God. So help us, God. Would you pray with me? We need you more than ever, God. We, we need you more than ever, and we long to see your transformation in us, in our world, we long to see your well-being, your shalom, your peace be spread where we live in our churches, in our missions, in our studies, in this college campus. We long to see that. And would you give us visual, concrete, tangible anticipations of the ultimate transformation of everything. Please, would you give us that? Would you allow us to participate in what you're doing now? Despite our failures and limitations, we, you don't have any, Lord. You don't have any failures. You don't have any limitations. Allow us to participate in what you're doing in Christ to reconcile all things. We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.